Hello, now we're going to talk about ecology. Ecology is the study of uh, natural systems and the organisms that live in natural systems interacting with each other and interacting with the, uh, the environment around them. Uh, with population ecology, we're focusing on particular species that is occupying a particular space. And um, we can characterize a population by density or dispersion, how they're distributed across the landscape. Um, so density is going to be a function of these things. Uh, birth and immigration is going to add to the population. Immigration and death is going to take away. So these things together determine the size of the population and then therefore the density of the population. Um, dispersion can come in several flavors, if you will. They can be clumped across the landscape. You can have a relatively uniform distribution across the landscape, like these uh, nesting penguins. Or it can be relatively random. Okay. Now, demography is the study of population dynamics, um, birth and death rates, um, and fertility rates, basically the factors that determine whether or not a population is growing or shrinking or staying the same. And we can use life tables to study demographics. It just basically shows for a given species, when you look at the different age groups, essentially what is the mortality rate at that age, um, and um, essentially where is most of the mortality occurring, um, what is their lifespan, um, and from these you can generate survivorship curves, which as it says here is just a graphical way of looking at survivorship, and so you can see for these squirrels, for example, they have relatively consistent decline through time in a given group of individuals that are born at a particular time. But we can classify survivorship curves as three types, type 1, 2, and 3. And so in a type 1 curve, <coughs> excuse me, this is where most of the individuals that are born survive the early stages of life, and it's not until much later in life that mortality kicks in. And there's another squirrel where mortality is relatively consistent through time. And then other types of species where there's lots of mortality early on, but then once they reach a certain age, they, you know, usually survive. Um, there are some generalizations we can make about these types of species. With a type 1, they'll be a type of species that generally has fewer offspring, but gives more parental care to those offspring, just in, thus increasing their survivorship. Whereas with type 3, these will be organisms that tend to have lots of offspring with little or no parental care. <clears throat> and, and, and so therefore, those offspring have low survivorship rates. Another component of demographics, uh, reproduction. Um, and so you can look at, again, different cohorts, different ages, and when reproduction is occurring. You can see the yearlings here. They don't reproduce at all. But then in the second year, they start reproducing. Um, and so they kind of reach a maximum size or maximum output at four to five years, and then it begins to decline. Um, but fertility up until uh, the last stages here. Life history encompasses um, many characteristics of organisms, uh, such as um, reproduction. That is, is it a type of organism, a species that reproduces only once? Or is it one that produces many, reproduces many times? These are the terms, semiparity and iteroparity, that applies to animals and plants. These are known as monocarpics. They just reproduce once. And, um, and polycarpics are ones that have many reproductive episodes throughout their lifespan. And so an example of semiparity or really monocarpy in plants is the century plant that just has, is a relatively long-lived plant, but it only reproduces once, produces this large cluster of flowers on the stalk. Okay, so whenever you... Um, look at reproduction in organisms is always trade-offs. The goal, of course, is to produce lots of offspring, but it takes effort to
produce all those offspring and then in some cases to take care of them. So there's often a trade-off between uh, how many you have and or how many you possibly want to have but how many you actually have. And so we see in this uh, experiment with these birds, this is the normal brood size for um, um, or for the normal brood size, these are the percent surviving. Now when they experimentally enlarged the brood size for these birds, the survivorship wasn't so good. When they reduced it, survivorship was a lot better. But again, you have fewer offspring survive or fewer offspring that you're producing here. And in this situation over here, you have too many. So the trade-off is you kind of produce in the, the average size and so um, survivorship isn't quite as high, but you have more offspring and so it should uh, should average out. Okay, and so again, you can be a species that produce lots of seeds, for example, lots of offspring, or relatively few. Parental care is going to vary, again, as we've talked about. With smaller broods, you can give more parental care, and with larger, you can't give as many. All right, let's talk about population growth. Now, the simplest way to think about population is growth is what's called the exponential model or exponential increase. And here's our formula. And this formula simply says that for any given time period, the change in numbers in that given unit of time is a function of the reproductive output or the reproduction rate and the number of individuals that you have. And so this kind of growth will lead to what we call exponential growth. Again, you've got reproductive output, number of individuals, and it will give you this kind of curve, this J-shaped curve. <clears throat> when you have higher reproduction, it, it's a steeper curve and shoots up faster than when you have lower reproduction. That kind of makes sense. Um, so species can exhibit uh, exponential growth in the short term. But in the long term, that's not the case because they just can't grow forever because uh, things become limiting in their environment. Space, food, uh, predators start to get them, etc., disease. And so the more realistic model is what's called the logistic model, which incorporates the carrying capacity, labeled K. And um, so the model basically looks like that. That's the equation. And so what you see is that when the population size is relatively low, you'll have lots of reproductive output per person, per individual. But then as the population size decreases, that reproductive output comes down. And of course, if you have a population size that exceeds the carrying capacity, there'll tend to be forces in the environment that bring you that population back to the carrying capacity. So here we're factoring, factoring in the carrying capacity. And you can see when you look at this equation, you don't have to memorize this, but you do need to know what these variables are. Again, the change in numbers in a given period of time is a function of reproductive rate, uh, number of individuals, and the carrying capacity. And so you see as n gets closer and closer to k, this part of the equation gets closer and closer to 0, such that when n is equal to k, you should have a 0 change in numbers. The population should not be growing. And that will give you this kind of curve, this S-shaped curve, where you have an early period of exponential growth, but then as you approach carrying capacity, the uh, growth rate, the, the, the change in numbers, the number of new individuals being added should not change anymore once you reach the carrying capacity. All right, now um, sometimes populations can exhibit this nice S-shaped curve. Other times they can sort of overshoot it and be brought back down again due to some of the limiting factors. Um, and sometimes they just bounce around. There's not really any stability to the population size. Okay. <coughs> All right. Now we can um, talk about species that have some general characteristics and we can speak of what's called case selection and R selection. Um, 
And K selection is when there's a lot of density dependence in that population. That is, there's a lot of things that are um, restricting that population as it becomes more densely populated. R selection are ones that are species that tend to maximize their reproductive output. Um, so, um, let's just keep moving along here. I want to get past this one as well. Now, look, this is a little interesting because it does show how these different curves. This one in the upper right, it says density independent death rate. So this is showing a death rate that doesn't change, but the birth rate does. And this one is showing a birth rate that doesn't change, but a death rate that does. And where the lines cross, you get your population density, your population size. How are the probably the more realistic way of looking at it is this way, in which um, the uh, birth and rate death rates are both density dependent, which is probably a more realistic outcome because as you have a low population, you'll tend to have higher birth rates and large population lower birth rates. And the same when you have a smaller population, death rates will tend to be lower. And when you have a larger population, death rates will tend to be higher. Um, okay, and where those lines cross should be your, your carrying capacity, your population density. Okay. All right. Um, so what can, again, control the size of a population? Um, Lots of different things. Competition for resources. Uh, there's only so much food out there that's available. Um, and as the population gets larger, then there's more competition for those resources. Space can be limited. And as the population gets larger, there's more competition for that space. Um, and uh, some animals are very territorial and like to mark their space, as this cheetah does. Um, Okay, now um, the health of the population can change with density as uh, populations become more densely populated, then it can make it easier for pathogens to spread. And of course, then there's, when there's less food, they're not quite as healthy. And so the overall health of the population can decline. Um, <clears throat> predators, when you have a large Population predators can tend to focus on the particular prey more because there's lots of them when is composed as compared to when there's relatively few of you. Um, so that can play a role. Um, sometimes uh, organisms, including people, can basically produce lots of waste that can have an impact on the population. Um, in the case of other animals, it would just be their, their bodily waste that can accumulate and become a problem. Um, all right, okay, so let's see, let's just keep moving along here. Again, populations can jump around. They're not always necessarily stable. Uh, it can depend, again, on predators. It can depend on the food supply. Um, again, you can see here, it's thought that this decline was due to predators, whereas this was due to a hard winter that basically knocked back their food supply, um, those moose. <coughs> okay. Of course, populations um, can be interconnected to each other, and so we refer to the, sort of a population of populations as a metapopulation. Um, and there can be immigration between those populations. Um, now, a good example of a predator prey cycle. Which, uh, let's see, I'm going to have to stop here because I'm almost out of time, but we will come back and talk about the s snowshoe hair and the links in the next video.